helping us to navigate the market is our next guest, Todd Harrison. He is the founder and chief executive of Minionville Media. He's also the author of the new book, The Other Side of Wall Street. Todd, always great to be with you. Thanks for coming in. As someone that has been watching what's happened to the markets, I want to focus on oil right now. Gasoline, $3.78 average, the AAA reporting. We're just going into the big driving season. Oil, Brent, West Texas Intermediate, over $100 a barrel. What do you think this is having to do with investor psychology? Well, I'll tell you, I feel like I've seen this movie before. Uh, be careful for what you wish. Uh, for those who are looking at crude and saying, if only crude could go lower, then stocks could rally, and that's been a, a headwind for stocks. Uh, I look at it very much as asset classes as a whole have rallied. Uh, we could talk about why in a bit. Uh, but I think if crude uh, meaningfully uh, trades lower, then it's going to be more endemic of slowing global growth. I think that's something to be uh, careful of. And, and I also think part of the rally was, was very much, uh, it was trying to encapsulate a lot of the geopolitical political concerns uh, that, are, that are percolating around the world. So I think it's been a proxy for that and a vehicle for that for traders. So why do you think asset prices have increased? Because it's not only, even though we had a, a drop in, in stock prices today, right. you could take a look at year to date. Stocks have done pretty well. Also, if you're invested in commodities, that's done pretty well. And indeed, if you invested against the U.S. dollar bet on the euro, yep. you'd be happy too. Yeah. And well, I think that if you look at it through the lens of what's going on uh, with uh, the rally versus the recovery. And I think you need to draw a distinction uh, in the rally versus uh, the economic recovery in this system formerly known as capitalism. Uh, because as we Why know, formerly known as well, capitalism, you know, listen, Todd? If, 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 you're, if you're given crutches to walk along, uh, then I think it's going to be hard to tell how, how good your legs are. And I think that's been the case for the last two years. You know, a lot of people, uh, Stephen Roach, a very smart guy, was on earlier. I was watching on Bloomberg. Uh, and he talked about, uh, you know, the framework and the historical context. And I agree with that. There really is no historical context to lean against. That being said, and seeing both sides, you can look at the credit market. You say credit markets trade great. That's giving you a, 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 a thumbs up on equities for the foreseeable future. But let's see what co goes on into earnings, given the rally that we've had into earnings. Let me guess. You might be referring to Ben Bernanke and the Federal Reserve unleashing a torrent of liquidity in the market by buying up treasuries. Is that it? Listen, if, if, if you put a couple trillion dollars in me, I'm sure that I'd be a lot better looking, too. <laughs> so what happens when that money goes away, do you think? Because we're looking at a June deadline, no more purchases mm -hmm. by the Federal Reserve, at least as far as quantitative easing part two is concerned. Does the market have, as you just used the, the analogy, legs past June? Well, it's tricky now because what we've seen is a, is a risk transference, and, the, and, the, and risk is transferred from uh, from corporate America. And now, you know, we see it in the sovereign side, or we see it on the consumer side. You have this debt sandwich where corporate America, where the market is focused on, uh, is presumably in pretty good shape right now. And that's the whole point, or was the whole point, presumably, of why uh, they they got the market to where it is, so that banks could roll their debt over and they could issue more stock. And they've largely done that. Uh, but I think that the, the risks that are going to manifest going forward without the the official hand of the government in place uh, are going to be geopolitical. It's going to be tied to social mood. And it's going to be an interesting back half of the year, I think. Well, indeed, if you take a look at just the six months of this current fiscal year for the government, they've run a deficit of $840 billion. Now, in just in 2009, that wasn't that long ago, $840 billion as a deficit, that was more than the whole year. So is it possible that government is going to really enact some kind of stringent measures, or do you feel that we're just going to play more politics as we get closer to the election? Uh, you know, ultimately, I don't think it's going to be our choice. If you look at the austerity measures overseas, and uh, we're not that far away in terms of what our balance sheet looks like as a country. So, uh, you know, if you're looking at higher taxes or, or austerity measures as the only two ways to get back to even, so to speak, uh, then I think that's going to have to play out here. And, and there's a lot of resistance now uh, from consumers. So that's where I think a lot of the social strife is, is, is starting to manifest from. But uh, it's going to be an interesting back half of the year for sure. And uh, just watch your risk and just have a, and remember where we came from, because if you don't remember where we came from, then, then, it's a, then it's a waste of time. What about safety? I mean, if you were advising clients or if you were talking to potential investors and they <clears> all said to you, I've got one letter, I want to be safe, one word, one four letter word, I want to be safe. What would you recommend? Um, oh. Cash comes to mind, but uh, that you know that has an asterisk on it. Also, uh, I think patience uh, comes to mind. You know what, what uh, the market operates on historically is greed and fear, uh, and we are overshooting now the other way. And that's not to say the market can't continue higher, uh, but for sure, uh, I think prudence is, is dictated. Uh, I don't think earnings, by and large, are going to matter. I think that's what everyone's the the reason that 
folks are ass assigning to the rhyme right now. Uh, but I think Really, they're not going to matter. In other words, people <clears throat> are more concerned about other things than they are about the details of a particular company. I, Why? Because they're already invested. I, I mean, well, you know, I'm looking at it through the day-to-day -day lens, and you could say that the market traded in a 10-handle range in the S&P last week. Right. So everyone's waiting for earnings. Alcoa, I give them a lot of credit. They got the best PR team in the world. Uh, you know, I don't Could, know how, couldn't spin the <laughs> stock higher. It was down 6% you know, today at one point. But, but I think uh, or we'll get through earnings. Uh, I think outlooks are going to matter. But I think then once that passes, then we've got to deal with reality again. All right. My guest is Todd Harrison. He is the founder and chief executive of Minionville Media. And he also is the author of a new book. The book is called The Other Side of Wall Street. In business, it pays to be an animal. In life, it <clears throat> pays to be yourself. All right, let's talk about the book, Todd. As you know, I've read the book. I want to know why you wrote it. Let's start there. Well, um, that's a, that's yeah. I'm throwing you an easy one first. Yeah, yeah. Go well, ahead. Listen, it, you know, in, in a certain respect, it's a catharsis. Um, and in another respect, it was, you know, this is a story that I've been uh, that I've been living for a long time, uh, and I've seen a lot uh, in my 41 young years on this earth. Uh, and this is uh, really, you know, given what we've gone through in Wall Street and the immediate gratification ADD, ADD society uh, that we're all living through and that we've gone through. Uh, my perch, and I, as you know, I, I raced, raced, raced to get to the top of uh, the industry and, and to try to get to that proverbial cash register. Got to where I thought I wanted to be and then realized that uh, there is a difference between net worth and self-worth and having fun and being happy uh, and you can't measure yourself or validate yourself by a bank account. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I talk about those things. It's, uh, you know, not... Well, let me take you a little bit through the tra trajectory. Uh, so Morgan <clears throat> Stanley, all right? Yeah. You're there at Morgan Stanley and... You kind of get the hang of it after a yeah. while. I mean, and, and you start, you know, hitting a lot of home runs for the firm. But the firm doesn't seem to reward you, at least in the way in which you felt entitled. What happened there? I mean, <laughs> what was that feeling like? Because you were, you were making money for you. You were making money for the firm. Yeah. Well, you know, to be fair, there's a lot of politics. Yeah, and Morgan too. Stanley gave me my break, and Chuck Feldman, in particular, gave me my break coming in. Uh, but once I uh, achieved a measure of success and I was promoted, uh, all of a sudden the funny stories that uh, that I would come with on on a Monday morning weren't perceived as being funny anymore. It was being disrespectful to the franchise, and uh, you know, it was very interesting to watch the political beasts within a firm like that. Uh, and and that came to a head ultimately uh, in 1996, I believe it was, uh, and it was. Uh, it was just an interesting, you know, from the inside of the beast, from the belly of the beast, to watch the way it played out. And luckily, I, I, I crawled out of an ear somehow, and uh, and I, I found my way to Galleon, uh, which was another story altogether. And then ultimately to Kramer Berkowitz, where I was partners with Jim uh, for for a year. And we talk about that a little bit. Let me tell you about uh, Kramer Berkowitz, and you can give us the details because I want to set this up properly. You're at Kramer Berkowitz. <laughs> You're trading multi-million dollar portfolio. Mm -hmm. You're making big bets every year. You are ostensibly on the top of the world. You're at the top of your game. It's intense. It's difficult. It's challenging. You're doing well. You get a phone call one day, and that phone call changes your life. What was that? Who was on the other end of that call? Well, that was the, uh, an officer from the Maui Correctional Facility. Uh, to tell me that my father, who I hadn't spoken to in 10 years, was incarcerated. Uh, he was in solitary confinement and he was uh, making trouble. Uh, and to be clear, you know, I was having 30, 20, 30 million dollar swings in a, in a single day. Uh, and that phone call, uh, you know, as much as I was uh, active and reactive to what was going on in the world, I was just, I kind of sat back and I was a bit numb to what was going on. And, uh, you know, I give Jim Cramer a lot of credit in this instance for uh, really being a good friend to me and, and, you know, making calls on my behalf. And the next day, my brother and I were on a flight to Maui uh, and we found out a lot of things about our dad. We hadn't talked to him in 10 years. And, you know, to see him led into a courtroom in, in an orange jumpsuit with chains uh, after not having a dad for 10 years, uh, you know, it kind of put things in perspective in terms of making money every day and, and, and the amount of stress that I was putting on myself to, to perform every day. Uh, and that planted a seed that, that ultimately, uh, you know, was sown in, in a lot of different ways. And, and helped create the book. That stress that you were going through every day, have you been able to connect that and that desire, that ambition to what it was like? to grow up as a young person, to want some of the things that you didn't have growing up? Because you worked your way through school. You worked multiple jobs at Syracuse University mm -hmm. to get through, 
And in fact, the story about you getting your first job out of Syracuse University, I don't even know how you survived that. Explain that. Well, I mean, listen, I think we're all shaped, you know, by, by a collective net sum of, of our experiences. And, you know, this is, uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of twists and turns in this. And that's why I think it, it, it's appealing. Uh, but in no way is it, you know, uh, it, you know meant to be preachy or, uh, you know, talk about uh, my accomplishments. As a matter of fact, I'm actually uh, not comfortable with a lot of I know, things. I can tell. Yeah. You're ready. About, but but just book. to explain the, the transition that you made at Syracuse, because I think that was important for you, because that was really a way for you to launch yourself into this bigger world. Sure. Well, I was, uh, I was at Syracuse. I was in an advanced finance class, and uh, I was actually accused of cheating uh, because I blew the bell curve. Uh, and after a half hour with the professor, he offered me a, a job overseas, and there were a number of companies, one of which was Morgan Stanley. Uh, and I took that job, and, and I went overseas for the summer. It turned out to be the only paying job out of the bunch, which is good uh, for a college student trying to work his way through through school. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, I think this is a good story, Pim. Uh, I think a lot of people will, will relate to it because it talks about priorities uh, and it talks about being able to look yourself in the mirror when you brush your teeth and like the person you see uh, looking back at you. And I think that's important now, especially when people are struggling economically and financially. Uh, I think that uh, the, the ability to really uh, to, to, to gain wealth in another, in another perspective is important. Now, you've gone on, as I've described you, your chief executive of Minionville Media. That was not an easy softball for you. I mean, because you also faced some very tough times there, yeah. and it's still a struggle. It's a publishing business. Mm -hmm. It's still mm -hmm. difficult. How did you decide to create Minionville? Well, you know, I'll tell you. You know, for the people who are sitting out there saying, "Well, it's easy to say all this when you have money," uh, I will tell you that uh, along my journey, there were points where I was sitting with my advisors, and they told me point blank, "You're going to be insolvent in a matter of weeks or, or months, rather." Uh, and that's a pretty daunting thing after you've had uh, millions and millions of dollars in the bank account uh, a short year later to be told that. Um, but it's been a transition. It's been, you know, it's a labor of love, but you're right. It is a labor uh, and it continues to be a labor. These are dynamic times to be trying to operate a media business. And a good manual for anybody in business or anybody wanting to learn more about their role in the business world and their own personal lives. I want to thank you very much. Todd Harrison, the other side of Wall Street, uh, very courageous. Thank, thank you, you very much.